Next, our next talk is by Ruzba Yousafzadeh at Yale University. He's talking about deep learning interpretation, flip points, and homotopy methods. It's, it's great to be here uh, and present. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Diane O'Leary at University of Maryland. So first I'm going to talk about deep learning uh, for interpretation problem for deep learning functions. Then I will uh, talk about present a homotopy method for solving optimization problems about deep learning. And at the end, I will present some empirical results. Uh, so uh, deep learning is used in many different applications. Uh, its use has become widespread, uh, but these models are computationally complex and uh, there is not enough understanding about how they work and how like their functional behavior is a question. So the questions that are usually arise in the interpretation are natural questions like how confident can we be in the correctness of a classification or what features in the input are more influential. Uh, we can ask these questions on the individual level like specific inputs and specific outputs or we can ask them on the group level like what are the most influential features for this, this group uh, for a group of images. Uh, so mm, I'm going to focus on classification, uh, deep learning, uh, classification use of deep learning. Uh, and so once we train a network, train a model to classify, it's basically, uh, we can think of it as a function that maps inputs to classes. Uh, and by inputs, I mostly have images in mind, but other types of inputs are uh, possible too. Uh, and uh, what basically the model learns during the training is that it uh, partitions its domain and assigns a class to each of those partitions. So basically the input, when the input comes, it gets mapped to the one of those partitions and then the class would be the output of the model. And these partitions are defined by the decision boundaries. Uh, but the decision boundaries for deep learning is uh, in the high dimensional space, they're geometrically complex and they're not so easy to study or investigate. So let me define some notations. Uh, let's consider a train model N, uh, some input X and the model maps that X into uh, the output Z. Z is usually a vector normalized by softmax function and each element of Z corresponds to one class and the class with the highest softmax score is the prediction of the model. So the questions I described earlier, we can try to formulate them as optimization problems and think of the N as a function and incorporate that in that optimization problem and try to solve them. So different types of questions would lead to different types of optimization problems. In this talk, I'm going to focus on a specific optimization problem about the decision boundaries of the model. So uh, let's consider a model that is like classifying tumors as being cancerous or not. Uh, let's say these are like images uh, or any other types of input. So uh, we define this concept of closest flip point, which means that we would like to find the least changes in that input so that we land on the decision boundary of the model with the other class. And this is, uh, we can define it as a, this can be formulated as a well-defined optimization problem. Uh, in the general setting of like a, for the multi-classification, uh, we can formulate the optimization problem as the following. So we have this input X, we would like to find the closest flip point to it uh, between classes I and J. Our objective function is a minimization. We would like to minimize the distance. The distance can be measured in different metri metrics, uh, but uh, for, for images, we use the two norm. Uh, and then the main object, main constraints have to do with the output of the network. So we would like the uh, output of the network to be equal for the two classes we would like to flip. And then the, we would like the output of the network for all other classes to be less than those. Uh, so these are the main, uh, this is the basic definition of the point being on the decision boundary between the two classes I and J. And then there can be other constraints as, as well. So for example, the domain is usually bounded, the pixel values are defined within a certain range. So we, we can impose those to make sure that we don't exit those defined regions for the pixels. 
Uh, and there could be some other constraints. For example, one might want to restrict uh, certain colors not to change or certain regions of image not to change. And this can be added to this list of constraints. So this optimization problem is nonlinear in objective and constraints. It is non-convex. It's usually very high dimensional. And the most important problem here is the issue of vanishing and exploding gradients for the network. So this is a common issue that is encountered when dealing with neural networks, and it has to do with the gradient of the output with respect to input. So when we write the, when we compute the gradient of the output with respect to input, we, we use the chain rule. And in these matrix multiplications, uh, the smaller values tend to vanish and the larger values tend to explode. And at the end, we get a Jacobian matrix that is not informative or not as informative as it should be. And the idea here is that to use a homotopy method to solve this optimization problem, which I'm going to focus on in the next few slides. So in the homotopy method, we transform the model uh, into a desired state, and then we gradually transform it back to its original form and uh, trace a path of solution until we find a solution to the original problem. Uh, with regard to the transformation, to do the homotopy transformation, we take two steps. The first step is we make sure the gradients in, in the neurons are bounded away from zero. So that this ensures that the gradients can flow through the neurons and uh, this uh, overcomes that issue of uh, exploding and vanishing gradients. The next change we do in the network is that we change the bias parameters in the last layer of the network. Uh, so that uh, the original input becomes a feasible flip point for it, so that we have a feasible solution for our optimization problem now that we have transformed the network. Uh, the next step, we compute the Lipschitz, we drive a Lipschitz bound on the, for the original model and the, for the transform model. And this way we can use the steps, the size of the steps to transform the network back to its original form. And then we, uh, as we transform, the, we take those steps to transform the model back to its original form. We, each time we solve the optimization problem using the uh, solution from the previous step as the starting point and uh, until we get the solution for the uh, original problem. So let me give some intuitions about how and why this works. So I'm going to use this uh, feedforward arch architecture in the formulations I will present in the next few slides. Uh, and for tuning the activation functions, we use the error function. This is helpful because error function is the antiderivative of the Gaussian function and its output and its gradients are bounded both. So this helps us uh, in the tuning and also like we can get different behaviors from the error function, like we can get linear, uh, linear behavior from it, or like we can get nonlinear, like a step function. So this captures the common behavior of uh, popular activation functions. So first we drive a bound on the Lipschitz continuity doing a recursion over the layers of the network. Uh, and then we show that the Lipschitz continuity of the model is preserved during the homotopy transformation and it changes within a range. So we know like how the Lipschitz continuity changes as we are doing the homotopy transformation. Uh, and then we show that uh, if we take the steps of the homotopy during the homotopy trans path, when we are transforming the model back to its original form, if we take the steps small enough, uh, then uh, the change in the output of the network is small enough. And then that makes us likely to uh, each, uh, each, time when, uh, each time the uh, solution from the previous step, it's more likely to lead us to the solution to the next step. And because we start with a feasible solution for the original problem, this, is, this makes us likely to end with a feasible solution all along the homotopy path and end with this feasible solution for the original problem. So let me now explain how this uh, can be used in practice and what insights we can get when we compute the closest flip points for the inputs. So the first insight we can get is a measure of confidence in the correctness of the model, for correctness of the classifications. So what we see in our experiments is that most mistakes made by the models are close to the decision boundaries compared to the correct classification. So this is for the MNIST model. Uh, we see that like uh, the correct classifications tends to be further away. Uh, 
And in the paper, we show that this, is a, this gives a better measure of confidence compared to the soft microscope. So in practice, uh, the soft microscope is, kind of, is usually used as a measure of confidence, but the cross entropy used for training, it has a small region of influence and the soft max score can be actually very high at small uh, distances from the decision boundary. Uh, so in overall, when we compute the distances for a whole data set, like with the 60,000 images, we see that that distribution uh, is very insightful compared to the soft max score. Uh, then we can also use this to gain insights about uh, the alternate classification. So for example, this is an image of an eight that was misclassified by the model as a three. Then we compute the closest flip point to it with all other classes. And we see that the, the distance to the decision boundary with class eight is very close. So if we don't know what's the correct class for this, we would, class, we would report the class as three, but we provide the additional information that this might actually be eight because it's very close to the decision boundary with eight. Uh, another application has to do with adversarial vulnerabilities. So uh, once we compute the closest flip point, that actually can be considered uh, an adversarial example uh, because it's a point arbitrarily close to it would be other, on the other side of the decision boundary with the opposite label. So in the adversarial literature, there are, these me there are different methods to compute adversarial examples and uh, they usually the ones that rely on gradients uh, take the gradients, take small gradient based steps until they cross a decision boundary, but they don't actually minimize the distance. Uh, so this tends to give uh, closer points to the original input that that, that could be, uh, we point out to weakest vulnerabilities. Uh, also for, uh, we can repeat this for groups of images and for any input, we get a vector that lands the input to the decision boundary. So Two minutes, we can, Ruth, sure. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, we can put them all in, into a matrix or a, a tensor, and then we can analyze the patterns in those matrices or tensors and find the influential features that land the inputs to the decision boundaries. Uh, so this is an experiment. This is, these are the principal components that would land images of uh, planes to the ship class for the C410. Uh, so there's a longer list. You can look it up in the paper if you find it interesting. Uh, I just mentioned that uh, this can be used to alter the decision boundaries as well. So if we can point, plant points in the, on the decision boundaries of existing models with specific labels in order to uh, move those decision boundaries. So I'm going to conclude. So we developed a homotopy method to solve optimization problems involving deep learning functions. We propose closest flip points as a tool to interpret the behavior of trained models. Computing closest flip points enable us to not only audit the trained models, but also debug them and to change their behavior. Uh, and flip, flip points uh, can reveal the weakest vulnerability of models with respect to adversarial attacks. And this has also implications for generalization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruzba, for the, for the interesting talk. I guess we have time for one question now, and we'll have to uh, discuss the remaining at the Q&A. The question uh, for now is, can you say briefly how expensive in practice is it to compute these flip points compared to, say, the softmax? Uh, so softmax is immediate. Uh, softmax is just you just um, compute the output and it's uh, not so expensive. But uh, computing the closest flip points is an optimization problem that is much less expensive that, than training the model. So computing the closest flip points for an entire data set would be less expensive than training a, a whole, the whole model uh, because uh, uh, the gradient computation is less expensive and also we are doing it for individual inputs. So we are not like dealing with all those 60,000 images that is used for training. So it's for like, for MNIST, it takes like about a second on a MacBook. So it's not quite expensive. Uh, thank you again. Uh, Ruzba, uh, there is, is a question. I think you talked about this very briefly, but do you see the main, one of the main applications of the use of flip points as a way to inform adversarial or to detect uh, adversarial examples. Uh, this seems to be an important problem that sh 
is gaining more um, interest in the community? Yes, I think it's uh, that there is a, so we have started this trying to interpret the models, but then we saw the, the direct connection with the adversarial. So uh, I think uh, it can be used in the sense that like if uh, an input is very close to the decision boundary, we can say, <laughs> maybe the model can abstain and say like, I'm not sure about this. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's very related to that. Also on the adversarial uh, studies, uh, there are these studies that try to uh, move the decision boundaries away from the inputs. So the model is more robust. So in that sense, we can put the flip points and like label them and move the decision boundaries and that would make the models more robust. Thank you for the question. Very interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, I hadn't heard, heard that before. Nice. 